Broadcasting from the campus of Lynn Benton Community College, we are the Mid Valley STEM CTE Hub. I'm your host, Casey, and this, this is Closing the Gap. Printing technology has evolved vastly since the Industrial Revolution. The same can be said about Koki New Century Inc., a family-owned and operated printing company based out of Springfield, Oregon. Today on the show, we are visiting QSL Printing Communications, a Koki business, to talk to fourth-generation leader, CEO, Melissa Koki. Please join me in the field for this episode of Closing the Gap. So are you ready to get started? Ready as I'll be. Okay. Yeah. So I want to talk about uh, your start in the printing industry. So you're a fourth generation business leader here. Yes. How did that, can you give me a little bit of background on how that started? Sure. My earliest memories are of riding my, my bike down the hallway in the print shop uh, growing up and just spending a lot of time there, learning through osmosis a little bit, but understanding that we had a family business and you know, dad would come home from work stressed out and we would um, be there on the weekends. He'd be working evenings and, and weekends and we would, um, you know, it, it was called the shop and, and the shop is much bigger today than it was back then. But um, just part of who we are is, is, is what we do, printing in this community. Awesome. So this isn't the same building as it was back in the day with your dad? It is in. not. No, our company has grown quite a bit uh, through mergers and acquisitions in the last 15 years or so. And so, no, we are not in the same building. And, in fact, recently we, we um, migrated all of our storefronts into one manufacturing plant just to streamline um, production and gain efficiencies. That's awesome. Yeah. So you didn't, like, start off um, in, like, studying printing for school, right? It, I thought um, when I what I read was you were like a sociology major. Correct. So how did that change? Um, how did you how did you make the switch? Correct. So when I went to school, you know, you decide what career you want to be um, when you go to college, which I think is a little bit unfair. I was I was 17 trying to decide what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And I had an, an athletic scholarship as well. And so um, I I got a major in psychology, a major in sociology, and then a minor in business and a minor in ethnic studies. And at the time, admittedly, uh, those classes were what fit with my softball schedule. And, um, you know, my dad was very influential in the business minor part, at least, you know, saying you've got to get that. For sure. Yeah. So um, I feel like sociology and psychology would be really great for running a business and like, you know, you can kind of get into people's heads, so to speak. Is it? Do you find it helpful? Did it? Did um, taking a, ma- a major and a minor that weren't really related to what you ended up doing helpful in the end? I think it's common to end up in a field that you didn't study in college, and and I'm no different than most people in that regard. But I I think that what I've learned about people has come through experience, and maybe not necessarily the degrees that I earned, but certainly you know putting in the work to earn a degree is an experience in itself. And the the people skills I've learned have really come on the job. Cool. Yeah. And then you were also saying that you had played competitive softball. Correct. I feel like doing a sport and that kind of discipline and having to go into practice like every day for months and months on end and, uh, you know, manage your studies, manage your life, manage your training, does that prepare you at all? Would you recommend someone do competitive sports while they're – I, studying and some training? I would. I, I, I feel completely blessed to have been part of that, and, and it definitely shaped the kind of leader that I am. Um, n- not just time management, but being on a team and learning. For me, softball, you know, you fail more than half the time at the plate. Um, you know, mm-hmm. a good batting average is in the 400s or 300s even, and that means you fail 60% of the time. And so you're always making adjustments. Um, you're trying things, and um, I, I mean – taking care of your body and, and those kinds of things are all all prepared me to be um, to be who I am today. Right so on. yeah, certainly certainly my participation in athletics was a huge part of who I am. Cool. Yeah. 
I think that, um, well, I'm very interested in talking to you because you're um, a woman leading a company. And I think that women tend to take on a lot of, like, non-promotional, um, like, tasks or, like, non, um, like, recognizable kind of workloads. And I was wondering how, um, like, as you moved up, how you, you know, kind of managed that for yourself and, like, what kind of advice you could give to young women that are starting their careers to, you know, make sure that they're doing work that they're going to uh, get compensated for. I totally understand what you're saying. And, and I think as women, you know, we're the first to get up to get everybody a cup of coffee and, and we, we make sure that the crumbs are swept up, you know, after a meeting. And that's just something that women tend to do. Um, I think that for me personally, I, you know, I am not saying don't take care of people around you, but I'm saying be cognizant of that. Um, be aware that you're doing that in the first place. And, um, yeah, make sure that you're, that you're being compensated for that or ask for help with those tasks because um, I think they, they genuinely fall on women to do that, to do those kinds of things. And so I on purpose now will, um, I'll wait for somebody to get up and, and <laughs> I will. And it's, a, it's sort of a little test, it's a little game, um, but I, I think it's, it's unwritten rules that, that fall on women a lot. And um, yeah, it, you know, it, it takes all to make the world go around and, and I think women more than carry their share. For yeah. sure. I think, you know, delegating is something I still struggle with, and it's something that I'm consciously trying to get better at. It's one of my self-improvement goals um, is just to trust other people with things, and you can't do it all, I, even though women try <laughs> to yeah. do it all. I, you know, I often feel like if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself, but that's really a, a bad, um, that's really a bad way to feel because it, you need to rely on your team to be effective, and mm -hmm. So for me, it's making sure people have training. It's making sure that we have established some trust. And you can do that by giving people smaller projects and, and building that trust and faith back and forth um, so that you feel comfortable to give them more. And um, then you can focus on the things you should be doing. Um, sure. Yeah. I, I am a do-it-yourself do it kind of person. So um, our team is really helpful in reminding me, like, there's somebody else who can do that. I mean, down to... Again, going back to I see something on the floor and I pick it up, and mm -hmm. and you know other people are capable of doing that. Right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, getting back to kind of like the more the, the side of your work that's like more technical, so like the printing stuff. Yeah. Um, what are some really great things about working in this industry? Sure. Well, every every day is different. That is for sure. And I, you know, as we're a manufacturing company, and so we we talk about good, better, best a lot. Mm -hmm. And we are constantly striving to be best. Um, you know, we fall short all the time. And so for me, it's that challenge of always trying to get better is one of my favorite things about the printing industry. We we don't think we're perfect. We know we're not perfect, um, and we are, but we're constantly striving to be. And so it's that just trial and error over time. It's it's measuring data. It's it's things like that. Um, and then on the on the customer side, we get to make our customers look good, mm -hmm. and and that's really really rewarding. What is your process of like trying to teach yourself that? Because I feel like that could also be a struggle that maybe a lot of our listeners have of like well, I have to do everything, you know, like to be, I don't know if it, it could be a competency issue or if it's just that like I need to, I'm, I'm the boss, I'm going to do it. What what were the kind of steps that you went through to kind of learn these um, like coping mechanisms? I don't know if it's sure. that's necessarily the right word for it. But yeah. Well, know. unfortunately for me, it's like you hit a wall and you feel very overwhelmed and then you take inventory of what you really should be doing. And so it, hopefully most people uh, realize that before before they hit that wall, but for me it was just I wasn't getting enough done in a day, and so how can I how can I work on that? I have I have great support system. I think it's important to have a girl gang, um, and it, and I, I think it's also important to have mentors um, and people that um, you can you can talk with your problems you know talk through your problems with, but also people that you're mentoring. Um, I'm I'm middle age I'd say I'm 47 so. Um, I have people that mentor me, and I'm also a mentor. Um, that's really important. So I think it's just a journey, you know, and next year hopefully I'll be working on something else. But this year I'm really working on time management, being efficient uh, with my time, and doing what I'm supposed to be doing to lead the company. Sure. Yeah.
was leading a company like your ultimate goal when you were a kid or did you have like other aspirations? It's it's really funny because I work with my siblings and so you know being my pa my parents represented the third generation of our of our business my my dad and his own his brother so my uncle and so it was always a, an option um, per se I won't say it was handed to us but we we often talked about succession um, when we were young and and it came to be that uh, I'm the oldest in our family and I. I possess many of the uh, stereotypical first child qualities, <laughs> so I am I am the bossiest, and um, it, it turns out I'm I'm the one who is the CEO. My siblings and I feel like we're all in the right role for who we are. Uh, my brother is a very um, technical, very smart, very good with math. He's a numbers guy. Not a he doesn't want to be a leader. He doesn't want to be. Um, he doesn't want to have a bunch of direct reports. And um, he's very effective. He's an independent worker, um, very effective that way. My sister is a, um, she works in our accounting department. She handles our HR. And she's a fabulous mother, you know. And so those are her priorities. And we feel like she's in the right role for her. So um, it's not by default. I, I do enjoy leading people. I'm a, I enjoy sales and marketing. I'm an extrovert. I'm involved in the community in many ways, and so for us, we feel like we're all in the right role for, for who we are. And my cousin works here, too, and he's out in the production department. He's happy, um, you know, working with his hands and, and working with people, and so he's in a good spot for him. Awesome. Yeah. What does, like, a CEO actually do? Like, could you kind of <laughs> give me maybe, like, a, like a little ro rundown of uh, kind of the day-to-day? -day? Sure. Yeah, sure. Well, my days are always different, but... But to me, it means I'm in charge of what goes on in this building. I'm in charge of how we look to our clients. I'm in charge of how we function internally. And so um, that means many that means different things on on any given day. Mm -hmm. uh, but my role is to make sure that I set the right expectations for our staff so that we perform and you know create happy clients. Awesome. Yeah. What kinds of positions are in the printing industry? I understand that you do a, a wide variety of printing here. What kind of professionals do you employ? We have, you know, I, I mentioned earlier it takes all types to make the world go around, and so we have people who like to work with their hands and, they, you know, they're doing manual-type labor. We've got delivery drivers. We have pre-press people who are setting really engineering jobs to um, be printed. We have an accounting department. We have um, salespeople who are very, you know, extroverted individuals that involved in the community. And so I think we've got a well-rounded group. Um, we've got business development people. We've got customer service staff. And so I, I think for us, we're looking for good people. Mm -hmm. And um, if, you, if you're a good person, we would have something for you. Cool. Yeah. Could you give me an idea of some of, like, the types of skill sets, like, both, like, technical and and soft skills that you would look for when you're hiring someone? Sure. So for us, we, um, we, when we hire, we look at a principle called humble, hungry, and smart. And so humble means, obviously, you're not a jerk. Um, <laughs> are you a jerk? That's not one of our questions. But humble people, that's important to us because we want people to come to a place where they feel accepted and, and that we work together as a team. So that's the humble piece. Hungry is are you motivated? Are you motive? Are you self motivated to um, you know do a job? Because I don't like to be a micromanager. It's I don't enjoy it. I don't have time for it. And so I like to hire good people that and just get out of their way um, in a lot of cases. And then smart is not necessarily you know what your SAT score is. It's it's your street smarts. And so do you know how to talk to people? Are you you know do you know how to frame? Um, the, the words that you say so that you get what you want. Um, are you are you able to, to work with people? Um, that's the that's really what smart means. Cool. Yeah. So I feel like you've given like a lot of really good points for young people that are looking to get into similar career paths to you so far. But I was wondering if you had maybe any like direct wisdom that you could impart on these on these young people that are listening. What is something that like you wish you knew when you were getting started in your career? Sure. Gosh, if I could go back and get a hold of that 20-year-old, <laughs> that 20-year-old Melissa, I would tell her that she's got a lot to offer. Uh, I think it's it's common for young women to feel that imposter syndrome. I would make sure that she's 
um, surrounding herself with positive influences. And um, I'm, I'm still, by nature, a constant learner. I think that benefits me in my career. Um, I would also make sure that, that you surround yourself with that girl gang, like I mentioned. Um, I'm really proud of my friends and who they are, and uh, they, they fill me up. Um, and I think that's important to have that support system. So just to build that into your life is important at a young age, especially. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I feel like a lot, a lot of times I hear that networking is important. And um, the more I hear that, I feel like the more it brings me back to reflecting on me and my friends and, like, my colleagues and how that really is, like, sometimes the best medicine for, like, growing, you know, is, like, getting to – the inspiration from your friends over here and seeing what everyone else is doing around you and how you can support each other. Absolutely. It's it's really, really important. I think when I'm happiest, it doesn't feel like networking. It's authentic. You know, authentic relationships are, are really key. My motto is do no harm and take no shit. And <laughs> I think that's, you know, if I can say that on your podcast, I think that is a, that governs me all the time in situations where, you know, I don't, I don't want to go out and, and offend anybody. I want to treat people well. I want to treat people fairly. That's really important to me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I have to I have to be sure I'm not taking any shit mm -hmm. um, because you have to, people need to respect you. And there's all different kinds of people around there. And, and for me, it's been learning who they are, how they're wired, how I'm wired, what are my blind spots? Can, you know, can we make solid decisions together? Um, that's been really helpful to me. So in the last, you know, since I've been kind of really learning about myself and, and who I am, I think that's really accelerated um, our success here, just relating to people, um, helping them, building them up so they can help, um, so I can delegate. Um, that's been key. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. No, I, like, I like that take no shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can we say that? Yeah, I, Good. I think we can say okay. that for sure. Okay. I think a lot of young people um, don't understand that. You yeah. know, like a lot of people that are starting off in their experience can be like, oh, I have to eat the shit. Yeah. You know, because this is what's given to me. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, practicing self-respect and, and, like, drawing boundaries is, like, a really important thing to do as a young professional. Absolutely. And it doesn't mean that you, you can't disagree. You can disagree, and you can disagree respectfully. And, you, and by doing so, you're bringing your, your value to a team. Um, I don't believe that one person can make well-rounded decisions because we all have blind spots. And so... When you have a well-rounded team, meaning you have people that are, you build a team around you that they don't think the way, same way you do, that's hugely valuable because they're going to bring things to the table that you never thought of. And so for me, it's, it's um, I'm not afraid of people who are different. I'm not afraid of people who think differently because they're going to bring, they're going to bring new ideas to the table and we're going to make more well-rounded decisions together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um that used to, I used to be concerned about having adversarial conversations or, you know, that person has crazy ideas. <laughs> well, I probably missed out on a lot of uh, valuable advice just by not being welcome to that. So these days we, we um, embrace that much sure. more than we used to. Do you have any words on how people could also work on embracing, like, um, what kind of techniques do you use in your in your day to day life trying to like include other people in the conversation that you might not have before? Sure. So for me, I I belong to Vistage, and so I've taken a DISC profile and learned that I'm actually a very um, I am a the details really matter to me. I really highly value the details, and actually I am um, I thrive when I work independently, mm -hmm. and so for me as a leader. That's huge to know that that's my blind spot, and I so I I work on over communicating because my communication, the way that I'm wired, it might not be enough for some people um, who are on the other side of the wheel, mm -hmm. and so I work really hard to what I think is over communicating might be just enough for the next person. So that's one tool that you can use. There's many other personality type tools, but for me. It's key to know how I'm wired, and it's also really helpful to understand how other people are wired. And so we have more people taking part in those um, in those tests, so that I understand what they value, and I can um, tailor what I'm saying depending on who I'm talking to. And and it's just so that I um, we find common ground, and so that I'm um, aware of kind of what they're struggling with. 
so that you know my father is a good example he is a um, he's a big teddy bear and he ran this company um, for a long time before I took over in 2019 I, it's noteworthy that my siblings and I bought the company at the end of 2019. So for one of the questions here, what are some of the challenges you faced in your career as CEO? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we did a lot of planning, um, a lot of succession planning, and one thing we didn't talk about was a global pandemic. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we take over at the end of 2019, and we are hit with a global pandemic three months later. Um, so. For me, our, our sales dropped 20 percent, so I did I had different problems um, than I expected I would, and it really um, helped me dig in, learn about our expenses, learn where we could trim costs that weren't people, because we we um, our goal was to get through the pandemic without laying people off, and we did that. That's even with it, it was really important to us, and we did that. Um, so I think that's a big win for us. We, we kept people employed, we kept people working, and we actually came out of it uh, a stronger company because of that. So I, I don't remember where I was going with that, but I, it reminded me I didn't talk about the pandemic yeah, at all, we're which we're about. sick of talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I think you were talking about interpersonal communication skills. Okay, yeah. yeah. So so for me and learning learning where I fall and what my blind spots are, I was talking about my dad. So with my dad, he's a very big um, S, which means support. And so he was, um, he did not like difficult conversations. He avoided those. He just wanted everybody to have a good day, have fun. And that's awesome, but it's not always, sometimes there are difficult conversations to be had and you have to set expectations. And so um, for me, I would, I would ask him to do something and he would mull it over for just what felt like eternity to me. And so l learning who he was and how he was wired and how I am and how I'm wired, I would give him a, I would, I would get him to agree to a deadline that I could live with. And so um, it, was, it no longer felt open-ended, like he didn't care about my, you know, my task. It was, you know, we agreed on a due date and then it was done. So right. it, it helped us get along uh, a lot better and, and we get along great. But that was a struggle for me for a long time. And so that's one example of how just understanding how you're, who you are as a person um, can help you relate to people who are obviously wired differently than you are. For sure. Yeah. Do you often feel like some sort of like, I don't want to say imposter syndrome, but like words in your mouth, but have those days where you're just like, I, you know, what am I doing here? This is really hard. Less and less. I, I used to, uh, but less and less. And, and I think that's maturity. It's also confidence. Um, I do feel like I'm the best person for this role, man or woman, and so uh, less and less do I feel the imposter syndrome. Right on. Yeah. I actually, sh just pretty much don't. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I didn't mean to, like, try to put that um, put that on you, but no, for it's okay. lack of a better term. Yeah. No, I, I understand where you're going with that, and, and I think owning it is important. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of it. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any like networking kinds of things that young people can do that are interested in, in entrepreneurship or like company leading? Well, that would be that would have been helpful to me. I wish I knew too. Yeah. I think you know I think it's it's about building relationships and um, I think in this community especially we're we're a small community so um, th there's very few um, what is it called like step steps of separation, what's that called? Degrees of separation. Degrees of separation. There's just fewer here, and so the, the more people you talk to and just learn from, the better. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't know what you want to do, that's okay. Um, just keep talking and, and keep trying things until you figure it out, because it's, it's, it's not, you don't figure it, not everybody figures it out at 17 and then goes to school for exactly what they want to do and then, and then does that thing, uh, and that's okay. Yeah, it's yeah, okay. Totally. You make adjustments, and you, then you get in the box again. For sure, yeah. for sure, yeah. It's kind of an interesting thing that we're, like, putting pressure on, like, 18, 19, 20-year-olds to decide their whole career path. You know, I, and they I agree. They don't have a whole lot of, like, you know, world experience. Yeah, I agree. 18-year-old me moved 10 minutes down the road to go to school, to play softball at University of Oregon, and 23-year-old me moved across the country to do anything but live in Eugene and just kind of see what was out there in the world. And then I eventually came back, and I always knew I would, but... Um, you know, people change and mature, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm, for sure. Difficult to pick what you're going to do at that at that age. 
Yeah, I definitely had no idea. I went back to school in my late 20s and um, had kind of went on a really roundabout way to get to where I'm at now. But I think that like, without you know taking that time to like get to know who I was as a as a person, I don't think I would have made it here. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I'm kind of thankful for you know being able to have time. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that that's there's a ton of value in that. And luckily, I had softball. Um, you know, that's really what I was interested in back then, and, and I've always been a good student, so I'm not saying that, but, um, you know, softball led me to the University of Oregon, and I was proud to, to play there, and, and I also got an education, um, but without that scholarship, you know, I might not have gone straight through college, mm -hmm. so it's tough to say. Yeah, tough mm -hmm. to say. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today uh, sure. for this interview. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I just really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Closing the Gap. If you like this show, subscribe on Spotify. You can also find us on Instagram at MVSTEMCTE, on Twitter at MidValleySTEM, and online at MidValleySTEM.org. Until next time, keep progressing. Keep progressing.